thank um, members Gardner, Gruel, Perry, Rosendahl, Smith, and Zine for being here. Um, we are now on Channel 35. Welcome to the Los Angeles City Council. Today is Tuesday, March 7, 2006. We meet every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday here in the Chambers, Room 340 at City Hall, uh, between uh, Spring and Main Streets, uh, Temple and First downtown. We also uh, not only welcome members of the public to come here at 10 a.m. on those Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Fridays in which we meet, but also to be part of the meeting through our remote facility at Van Nuys City Hall, where uh, individuals can come and be heard via our remote um, capabilities, and um, we can take public uh, testimony through uh, Van Nuys City Hall as well. We are being broadcast on Channel 35, LA City View, um, your channel, um, live now and rebroadcast in the evening. We also webcast through our city's homepage at www.lacity.org, um, where there's a wealth of information about uh, your elected officials, the workings of city government and departments uh, here as well. Uh, furthermore, we can be listened to through council phone, which is a number that members of public can dial um, to listen to the proceedings of the full city council or the committees of the, the city council as well. We have with us right now uh, council members Cardenas, Gruel, Perry, Rosendahl, Smith, Zine, and myself, Mr. Garcetti. Um, we have Mr. Parks now with us, and so we need 10 members to achieve a quorum. That's two-thirds of 15, and we are awaiting two more members uh, at this time. So I'd like to um, state for the record that Mr. Weiss is excused, uh, Ms. Hahn is excused, and Mr. Labonge are excused uh, today. Um, Mr. Um, Arreyes is excused to come a little bit late, so if uh, council member uh, Wezar, uh, Council Member Padilla, um, and Council Member Wesson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wezar. We're now at nine members, so if Mr. Padilla and Mr. Wesson could please make their way down, we'll have a full quorum and we'll begin this meeting. Thank you. Please call the roll. Cardenas, Gruel, Hahn, Wizard, Lamont, Padilla, Parks, Perry, Reyes, Rosendahl, Smith, Weiss, Wesson, Zine, Garcetti, 10 members present, and a quorum, Mr. President. Okay. Uh, as is uh, customary for our. Well, why don't we approve the minutes before we do salute the flag? Um, Ms. Hahn moves the minutes from our last meeting, March 1st. Um, Mr. Wesson seconds, if there's no objection. You know, Ms. Porter. I'm sorry, Ms. Perry will move that. It's always interesting to have someone who's not here move something. Um, next order of business. Approve uh, commendatory resolutions for approval. Okay, uh, Mr. Wezar moves, Mr. Wesson seconds. If there's no objection, those are unanimously vote approved. Next item.
Uh, Mr. President, do you wish to do the flag salute at this time? Yes. If I can please ask everybody in council chambers to rise. As is customary, we do salute to the flag to begin our week. And uh, if I could please ask Ms. Gruel to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. It would be my pleasure. Please place your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, Ms. Gruel. Uh, I believe Mr. Wesson has a special introduction to make uh, this morning. I'd like to re recognize Mr. Wesson. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, good morning, uh, Mr. President and members. We have some important guests that are with us today. I'd like for them to, uh, to, to, to come forward and welcome Mr. Bong, the, the president of the Korea uh, Daily newspaper. They are kicking off their Power Korea Week in 2006. Uh, it'll begin on March 13th through March 19th. And during this uh, Power Korea Week, they will be hosting a concert, business expo, film festival, and a large banquet. Uh, I'm proud uh, that I share representing uh, uh, the great uh, area of Koreatown with Mr. LeBange and, and Mr. Reyes, and I just wanted to make everyone aware of that and wish you great success. Mr. LeBange. Uh, follow Mr. Weston. Uh, come Sami Dao. Good job. Information is knowledge is power, and that's what this will be all about, and I just am glad to join with my colleague, Mr. Weston, and I know many of us, uh, uh, Mr. Smith has the, probably uh, the, the largest number of Koreans in, in the Porter Ranch area uh, in the community. Mr. Garcetti, and Mr. Reyes, all of us, it's all part of, you never know where the sign is for Koreatown. It comes all the way around the city, but this conference will empower people to make the right choices and be involved. I look forward to being involved. Come Samida. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to have you here. And Mr. Wesson, is there anything uh, you'd like them to say? Take a f we're going to take some photos at okay, this point. Okay, great. Thank you very much and welcome so much to come here to Los Angeles. We are very excited to have you here. Um, with that, let's go through the agenda. Next order of business, please. Uh, Mr. President, this is the time for comments from the public on items not on Council's agenda. Okay, now it's time for general public comment. Uh, this is available to all members of the public, again, through our Van Nuys facility, City Hall, um, or here live in person in, in City Hall. These are items that are not formally on our agenda, but are nevertheless under um, our jurisdiction. I'd like to ask Noel Weiss to come forward for two minutes, or up to two minutes, um, and Juan Pio Bong uh, for two minutes, and then Rosa Romero, and we have a few other speakers to be followed. So if we can please uh, make room for Mr. Weiss, and uh, if we can set the clock at two minutes. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, President Garcetti, Council members. Uh, I'm sorry Mr. Weiss isn't here today. I know Mr. Rosendahl is, but he's basically in the back. So I wanted just to address, I guess at this point, my comments uh, primarily right now to the city attorney because the city attorney, Mr. Delgadillo, is, is basically uh, in a situation here where he hasn't been heard from on this issue of Lincoln Place and the recording of the conditions. And I think it's important that the city attorney at this point take an affirmative position in favor of moving forward on this. And I'm, I'm going to suggest publicly to Mr. Rosendahl, in terms of meeting whatever concerns the city attorney may have, that Mr. Rosendahl basically amend his motion to allow for the recording of the conditions, not now, but on May 4th or May 5th or June 1st, basically to allow, if there's any objection, if there's any problem with regard to those conditions being recorded legally, that AIMCO can then go to court and seek whatever writ of mandate that will solve any problem with regard to any damage issues and with regard to this parade of horribles that apparently they're presenting. And Ms. Gruel, we're in a situation, Valley Village showed up to Lincoln Place. There, there are situations now that, that are happening all over the city here, and we're talking about land use speculation on the backs of the middle class. And I'm hoping that Mr. Reyes again isn't here, Mr. Rosenthal isn't here, Mr. Weiss isn't here, but hopefully we can be in a position where eventually we can uh, establish a positive precedent here where the city can basically push back and uh, uh, get this circumstance to where it has to go because this is a serious problem and it's not going to get any smaller. So I'm looking forward hopefully to the city attorney coming out from kind of under his rock here and basically doing what's got to be done, doing the right thing for the people and uh, not making the same mistake that they made before because he's already given bad legal advice. It's cost the city $185,000. Enough is enough. Time to move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is uh, Bong 
One pure. One pure bong. Going once. Going twice. From the Korea Daily. Nope. Okay. Um, Rosa Romero. Teachers for Safe Spaces. Welcome. You have two minutes to address the council. Hi, I've come here previously to talk about um, the South Central Farm, and I'm coming today as a representative of uh, United Teachers for Safe Space. It's a coalition of teachers that are working together um, to try to create more learning opportunities for children, especially in South LA, a district that has um, very little safe opportunity for children to learn. Um, I've been working with the children of the South Central Farm, and uh, these children are amazing children, and they're learn they know how to plant seeds, they know um, where an apple comes from, which I can't say many students in Los Angeles do. And um, this is a safe place that I think we really need to, we need your support, City Council, we really do. We really need to keep this safe space and we could, we could turn this into a, a huge park that would be available for all students in Los Angeles where we could have outdoor learning classrooms because I know that you know, many budgets have been cut in LAUSD schools and there's no longer availability of horticulture class or any kind of gardening projects in our science programs. So I'm coming to you as a teacher pleading for you to please help save the South Central Garden. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate your comments. Um, Dele? Is it Dele here? Excuse me if I... And then Sochita Luhan will be our next speaker. So the City Council of LA, on behalf of the International Community for a Green Los Angeles, I have come to bring again to your notice the fact that 350 families farming on the 14-acre piece of land in South Central Los Angeles are facing the possibility of eviction. Today, I want to particularly appeal to Councilwoman Jan Perry and the Mayor of Los Angeles to lead the initiative to save the dislocation of the lives of the farmers who are working this land. It is one of the few spaces of green oasis in the middle of the urban squalor called Los Angeles. It is helping to feed families. It is a safe space for children. And we also call on the members of the Los Angeles City Council who are green conscious not to remain silent on this issue. We plead with them to please speak up so that they can join in saving this space. It is a matter of civil rights, it is a matter of human rights, and we hope that this city will vote in favor to ensure that this largest urban farm in the United States is saved and that those farmers will not be evicted. Thank you very much. Uh, so Chitil Luhan and then Susie Martinez to be followed by Rosalba Cornejo. Good morning, City Council members. My name is Sochil Luhan, and I'm a representative of the Chicana and Chicano Studies Alumni Association at California State University, Dominguez Hills. Uh, I approached you all at the last meeting regarding the South Central Farm. Uh, I'm really inclined to ask the City Council to strongly consider saving this farm. The mayor wants a greener LA, this is one of the places that will make LA a greener place. It already provides uh, produce for 350 low income families and it gives the students an opportunity to see science and work as you had uh, a teacher come up earlier and speak about that in regards to the LAUSD system and budget cuts. This is one space that can be utilized by LAUSD to help students better understand and meet the standards that they expect teachers to meet for students. This is also a safe haven for uh, students and children, people in the community to come. I take my daughter myself every Sunday to the farm. She's, she plays with the children there. We eat good, healthy food. This is something that should be saved for the community. It is by the community and the city council, that should be one of your top priorities. The people living in this community are paying the taxes that you know help you. So you in turn should help them. You are their voice. It is up to you to save this farm as well. And it should be on your top priority list. Please, I implore you, Jam Perry, 
I also implore you, Madam, to take heed, take consideration, listen to the constituents of your community because they have been calling out to you, yet their voices have been falling upon deaf ears. Please help them, help them. They need you to step up also. Save the South Central Farm, thank you. Thank you. Susie Martinez. Welcome, Ms. Martinez. Good morning, City Council. My name is Susie Martinez, and I'm here on behalf. I am a Santa Monica um, college student, and I'm here to speak up about the South Central Farm. I am a born and raised Angelino, and I am also a member of the friends and family of the farm. You know, I, I spent the night at the farm, um, and I had the most unique experience. We have a common vision living there, staying there for the week, and they have teepees set up there. I slept in a teepee in a garden in the middle of warehouses in Los Angeles. I don't know anywhere else where you would have that experience. This is one of the most safest havens for children and students to come and learn and grow as people, as community members. We gather there and we, and we come together and we plant and we grow there. I urge you to save the farm. We need you and we need your support. Now is the time for action and we need your support for this. So save the South Central Farm. Thank you very much for your testimony today. Our last speaker is Rosalba Cornejo. Welcome, Ms. Cornejo. Hello, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Rosalba Cornejo, and the reason why I'm here is I'm a current student at California State University of Los Angeles. I'm a member of this community, and I would like the council, I would like to request the council support uh, to save the South Central Farm. Um, this is one of the largest urban farms in the United States. It is well known. Uh, 350 families supplement the meals that they grow in the gardens. There are no animals. It's actually local grown food that is fresh, which in turn gets fed into our children who actually play and do arts and crafts in this land. I don't know how many of you guys are actually aware that this farm exists. I don't know how many people have actually been to the farm. And I would like to encourage everybody on Sunday to come out and check it out. It's a beautiful place. If we want a greener LA and our mayor's totally pushing for that, we need to understand that in order to continue to have fresh air, we need to save our trees. And right now we have a 14 acre farm in the middle of warehouses that has thrived for 13 years, and we need to continue the fight. The farmers do not want to go anywhere. They shouldn't have to go anywhere. If we want a greener light, we need to save the few green spots that we actually have. And I would really, really look forward to the support of the council in supporting and saving the South Central Farm. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. If there's nobody else wishing to be heard in public comment, that closes our public comment for today. Uh, general public comment, and now we will continue with the agenda, Madam Clerk. Uh, before beginning the regular agenda, there is a request to continue item number six for one day, and that is to tomorrow, March 8th. Okay, is there any objection, colleagues, to continuing item six one day? If not, that'll be ordered. Next items. On the regular agenda, items noticed for public hearing. Item number one, the applicant consents to a continuance to March 22nd. Okay, if there's no objection, colleagues, that Item will be continued, item number one, until March 22nd. So item number two is also a public hearing item. It's a public convenience or necessity in uh, Council District 3, and I believe the recommendation would be to deny without prejudice. Okay. Anybody wishing to be heard on that? If not, uh, please open the roll. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. Twelve ayes. That is approved. Um, and just to be clear, the denial is approved. Mm. <laughs> um, next item. Next items are items for which public hearings have been held. Items three through seven. Item six has already been acted upon. Um, item number seven, there are two reports on the file. They both concur with a budget and finance has a slight correction on it. Okay, Mr. Parks. This would like to move the uh, budget and finance on seven. Okay, budget and finance on seven is before us. Any other specials, colleagues? Mr. Mr. Padilla? Item seven. Uh, Mr. Call special. Okay. No, Mr. Resign. Uh, Twelve. Item okay. seven. Call special. Seven special. But Mr. Padilla. Okay. Uh, we are not quite yet at twelve, Mr. Resign. But I'll mark that. Um, I'm sorry, Madam Clerk. My 
computer has current items three to five, and then it says below that three to seven. Are we? Uh, well, the, it's three to seven uh, is the uh, is the category that that's Okay, on. so colleagues, it's any other specials from three to seven? Okay, seeing no others, uh, Madam Clerk, please prepare the roll on the balance and tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. Okay, those are approved. Next set of items. Next items are items for which public hearings have not been held. Items 8 through 25, 10 votes are required for consideration. Those of you who are following along, we have two classes of items, those in which we've already had public comment, so we don't uh, hold a public hearing here unless there's a motion and those in which one hasn't been. Um, so these are the items which there haven't been public hearings yet. Any specials, colleagues? Ms. Perry? 22. 22 will be called special by Ms. Perry and because of the speaker cards we yeah. have here. Um, I believe also item 24, there's a card here, so let's call that special. And I believe council member Zine called item number 12. Okay, so we'll have 12, Mr. Zine. And any other specials, colleagues? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please prepare the roll on the balance and tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. Those are approved. Uh, next items. Going back to the items call special, item number seven was called special by council member Padilla. Okay, Mr. Padilla, item number seven is before us. I actually had called that special for uh, the chair, Mr. Cardenas. Mr. Okay, Ryan. Mr. Cardenas. Thank you very much. Today is a very exciting day for the city of Los Angeles and for communities throughout Los Angeles. Uh, as I begin speaking, if I could have uh, Connie Rice please come forward. Today what we are doing is we are going to embark on an opportunity to be honest with ourselves, to look at a very important reality in this city and to ask ourselves, are we investing properly in this issue? Are we doing everything that we can to make sure that we address the issue of gang violence, we address the issue of why children are involved in gangs, we address the issue of how, what we can do to make sure that these young people get out of gangs or never even enter into a gang. We've been in the process for several months now of putting out an RFP to see if we have the talent amongst us to be able to evaluate the city of Los Angeles and to evaluate, for example, the guesstimation or estimation is that we have $26 million annually that is, that is being invested in these programs throughout our city. And wh who we have before us is Connie Rice, who has put together an impressive, incredible coalition who is willing to look throughout the entire United States and look into this city at every program that we have and tell us the truth about what we are doing well, to tell us the truth about what we've done in the past and what we're doing today and make recommendations about what we should be doing into the future by investing in our children when it comes to the issue of uh, violence amongst our youth, gangs, and many other issues that, that, uh, that we're investing in today. Connie, can you please uh, give us a, a brief overview of uh, should you be successful in acquiring this, uh, this opportunity to work for the city of Los Angeles with your, your uh, group? Can you give us a brief example of what you would be doing uh, for the city of Los Angeles and what you, you would be coming back with? Thank you. Councilman Cardenas, and thank you okay. for your leadership of the Ad Hoc Committee. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today and to uh, talk to you about, I think, one of the most pressing issues the city faces. If we don't get a handle on what happens to our children who end up in La Vida Loca, I'm afraid that the future of the city is in peril for everybody. Excuse me, the Ms. Council Rice. Can I interrupt you for a sec? Can we please have a little bit more order in the council chamber so we can hear Ms. Rice clearly? Thank you. Please continue. Thank you, President Garcia. Uh, the what my team hopes to do for you is to help you to get a handle on what Los Angeles is doing now in terms of its strategies to keep children out of this crazy cult of destruction that we call gangs. But more importantly, what's the scale of the problem and why is it in the second largest city in the country you have no one to turn to to say how many children are in gangs, how many are going, how many have we gotten out? This is much more than a law enforcement problem. We have on our team key law enforcement officials, but we also have public health officials. We have deans of schools of public health who stand by to help to figure out what kind of child development model prevents children from even going near gangs in the first place. In other words, what does it take to keep kids from going into gangs? 
what do we do with the kids who are in gangs, and hopefully we will sketch for you what you have on the drawing boards right now, what's working, what isn't working, and is it a matter of scale? You have to ask yourselves the question. We've been fighting in this city, we've been fighting gangs for 30 years. We have five times as many gang members as we did 30 years ago. There's something wrong. And I think what the council is embarking on today is to get a colonoscopy on what this city has. And when I come back to you with this team's evaluation, I hope to be able to tell you what you're spending your money on now, what you're getting for your money, and what you actually need to be spending on what kinds of programs with the comprehensive sets of strategies. This isn't about just law enforcement. As Councilman Cardenas has, has said in the committee, it is about creating the ecology that creates children who make the right choices. It's about the individual development of the child, it's about the family, it's about the schools, it's about all of the public institutions, but it's the joint responsibility of the strategies that we don't have right now. We need comprehensive synergistic strategies that don't just look at the city. This is a regional strategy and I hope to be able to map that for you and chart a blueprint and a course for reaching a level of addressing this program, this problem that we haven't seen before. Thank you for, for giving us that outline. So, but at the, at the end of all that, you're gonna be coming to us with recommendations and you're gonna basically let us know uh, what is out there, what we're doing here, and also what we could be doing better perhaps, and also uh, giving us advice on the fact that, well, well, Connie, do you agree or disagree that we have great evaluation methods here in the city of Los Angeles today? My time. Uh, Councilman, with all due respect, I think you're assuming facts, not in evidence. <laughs> no, we have a very serious problem with our evaluations. We don't know how to evaluate these programs. Uh, we hope that we have some state-of-the-art people who evaluate these kinds of programs and can tell you what are the problems with evaluating these types of programs. Do you evaluate them like Alcoholics Anonymous or do you evaluate them like you evaluate a company producing widgets? How do you assess the different kinds of programs? And do we have the range of programs that we need? The answer I can tell you right now is no, according to the experts I've talked to. Is the city addressing this problem to scale? I can already tell you the answer is no. But I need to sketch that, our team needs to sketch that for you and answer very specific and hard-hitting questions about what are we doing with the money we have right now. Part of the study we also want to look at is what are the additional sources of funds? If we case this problem, at several billion dollars countywide. What are the strategies for getting that stream of funding? Don't forget we had a similar conundrum with school construction. It was a $30 billion problem. The school district was asking for $20 million at a time. There was no way that you would see what you're seeing today in school building had you not and analyzed that problem for the true scale of it and then developed the strategies for getting the voters to vote for those school bonds and that every single school bond has passed. That wasn't by accident and the exact same kind of analysis, casing the need and making the case for what the benefits are. Right now we're spending money in an ad hoc, unsynergistic, uncoordinated way and we don't even have the full spectrum of programs to be able to address every part of the spectrum of the issue. That's what I'm hoping to do uh, for the ad hoc committee and for the council. Thank you. I think it's very important for us to understand we've already embarked on, on, on getting involved in gang prevention programs, intervention, suppression in the city. And once again, I'll say right now the guesstimation, it's about $26 million a year. But the thing that we need to understand is that we need to have the political will to be able to confront the fact that we are not evaluating ourselves properly. We need to have the political will to hold ourselves accountable as a city and as a body. We need to make sure that we take our gang activity reduction strategy, and this is spearheading this strategy, and making sure that we look ourselves in the mirror and say, are we failing in some areas? Are we doing well in others? But overall, are we doing what is right and what is effective and efficient for the people of Los Angeles? When it comes to gang activity, when it comes to juvenile crimes when it comes to making sure that we do what's best for our children. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cardenas. Uh, we have a number of council members interested in uh, making comments as well. Mr. Rosendahl is our first, to be followed by Ms. Gruel, then Mr. Wesson, and Mr. Zine. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, Connie. Good morning. 
Good to be with you. And for those people in the uh, television world, they see the Homeboy Cup here, which I've had with me since I got elected to the City Council. This is Father Greg Boyle, and it's jobs for young people rather than gangs. It's opportunities rather than despair. And he will be with you, part of the group, doing this evaluation. It is a regional issue. Santa Monica just had a, a drive-by shooting last week. The gangs that come through my district, the 11th district, uh, go into Oakwood, uh, go into um, over by the Mar Vista projects, and into Santa Monica. Gangs know no borders, so it's obviously regional. And what I am so excited about is this will be the best spent half a million dollars because it will go toward, number one, understanding what's going on, the facts. We just want the facts. We want the information. And we know that once we have a baseline to work with, we should be developing the prevention strategies that work, obviously education, after school programs, eh, job. And let me just ask you, Connie, what do you envision coming out of the study? Councilman Rosendahl, several things. We will give you charts that will show you every single program that you're spending money on, what it does, what it doesn't do, and how it compares nationally to similar programs across the country, and how much money you're spending on it, and what the current evaluations are, and what proposed evaluations should be. That's what is LA doing now. The second part of this is what should LA be doing to really address the scale of the problem. And that's going to inc involve a national survey and also a survey of what's going on here because there's some very smart people working on this problem here in Los Angeles County. We will be consulting all of them and you will get a matrix of all of those programs. But what we're going to tee up for you are the different kinds of models. Do you just want a law enforcement model and a suppression model? Do you want a medical model? Do you want a prevention model? And do you want a community development model? And do we need to craft something that is a merger of all of those that is something new? We don't have to stick with what's known, but you need to map what's known so we can figure out what we can create new. This is the purpose of this is not to create a department. It is to understand the structural, medical, law enforcement, and other kinds of policy areas. Gang intervention, we've got all of the major gang intervention uh, uh, experts working with us on this, as well as law enforcement, as well as the PhDs from public schools of health. And what we want to do is present those choices to you. What, should, what do you want to do? But we will map the consequences of those choices for you. And finally, the funding. What are you currently spending money on? What are you getting for that money? And what, what's the real scale and price of really addressing this problem? So it'll be a blueprint. It'll be a map. And I hope that from there, you will then be able to make the right choices and have the courage to go for the big solution. And then from there, convince the voters to back it. Well, thank you very much. And colleagues, it's called doing our homework. This project will be doing our homework. It will outline the issues. The truth will set us free. The facts speak for themselves. I urge approval um, of this motion today. Thank you. Mrs. Gruel, uh, to be followed by Mr. Wesson. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Garcetti. Um, and thank you, uh, Connie, for kind of creating this consortium to, to do this, because uh, I know you have a lot of other issues that you deal with, but no uh, one of them is more important than the issue of trying to deal with our young people and how to develop alternatives um, to, to fight the issue of gangs and think how critically important this uh, proposal is. And I think I said the other, other day, it's about time um, that we took a hard look at what we are doing, uh, what's been successful and what's not, and make some, I think as Mr. Uh, Cardenas mentioned, you know, make some tough choices. Um, but the issue has risen, um, and it's, uh, I think, something we've all known, but is now a focus of uh, so many um, uh, people in the city and across the country about the importance of looking at both prevention and intervention um, and enforcement in some instances which are critically important. I did ask uh, in the uh, committee uh, and just wanted to give you an opportunity to share as well um, to, as you look at your consortium, the importance of having representatives from the Valley because we find in the areas of the of the northeast uh, and, and north part of our, our valley, even including Mr. Smith's area, um, parts of that which, again, we have a very high gang, and, and just to talk about how you're going to involve all of the communities in your ultimate kind of plan that comes forward. And hold my time, please. Thank Councilwoman Grohl, thank you, and thank you for your leadership in this.
this issue. You you were at the beginning of this ad hoc committee, and uh, very much appreciate your your, your continuing efforts. Uh, you're absolutely right. This is not a South LA or a West LA or an East LA. It is or, or Los Angeles region, and it isn't even just the city. So we will be designing neighborhood-based strategies because that's what the experts tell us works. You can't have it just from the top down. You have to have it grown from the bottom up. They have to be organic strategies that work for each neighborhood. And neighborhood, I, I, I don't even want to raise the specter of the neighborhood councils, but as they develop, they are going to become a piece of any kind of strategy. The schools are also an incredibly important focus. And I'm talking about a new norm for these institutions. They cannot continue to operate at the level that they do and expect to address this problem. So what we hope to sketch is what is, but more importantly, what needs to be for every single area of the city. In this short six months, ladies and gentlemen, we cannot give you the full blueprint. We can begin to tee it up for you. And it would be hard to find a better set of experts. People are joining this contract at a loss of money. No one is making money on this. This is a, a, an operation of love for this city and concern for its future. So the experts that you have, experts from RAND, UCLA, USC, experts from the street, a gang intervention strategist, including Blinky Rodriguez. We have Bill Martinez, who uh, used to run county, the county gang services. We have a lot. We have law enforcement up the kazoo. We're going to have to get them a new norm as well. All of us are going to have to learn to operate at a different level. But what's critically important is the intelligence from the communities. The communities have to be at the table to design the strategies because they are an incredibly important piece of it. And Pacoima in the East Valley is one of our hot spots. It's not written about. It's not written about in the papers, but it is much a hot spot as you can find in Linwood and Watts and other areas of this county. And we need to pay special attention. There has to be hot spot strategies, the hot zone strategies, but that does not mean that you ignore the rest of the city. Because where one hot spot is, law enforcement will tell you they metastasize. And the point of this contract is to have the city stepping up to a much higher level, a much more sophisticated level, to really end this problem, not tinker with it, not reorganize it, end it. And I think as you mentioned, and thank you very much for, for that response and the response you had in budget and finance the other day, because the importance, I mean, for example, when I met, we met with a new captain uh, for the Foothill Station, uh, sat down with myself and my staff members the other day, uh, and we talked about uh, some of the gang problems we were having uh, in our Sunland Tahunga area and kind of going into North Hollywood. And uh, we talked about the Tunerville gang, which he said, you know, many, many years ago uh, when he was another station in East Los Angeles, that was their base. And that, again, as you mentioned, it's not just one little neighborhood. It begins to, to spread um, and to be able and impacting our, our young people. And so I think it's great that you're looking at uh, a variety uh, of programs um, and know that all of us on this council want to be, to be helpful. Um, and maybe one of the things you'll do is, is sit down and talk with uh, you or Bill to sit down with each of the council offices and say, what, you know, what have your experiences been? What are the kind of programs that you've seen uh, be effective? Um, and you know, today there was a, a big article in the Daily News on the Jeopardy program. And, some of its successes and challenges, um, uh, and everything from an LA's best program that we know helps hopefully kids that are younger before they get into to the gangs. So I'm just thrilled with the, the selection and the efforts and um, was pleased to be part of that early uh, ad hoc committee and supporting uh, this budgetary item last year to make sure that we were able to, to get this uh, ball rolling. So thank you again for your leadership and this again, will not be the last time we have this kind of discussion. And I think that's what's important about the creation of this original committee and the creation of this contract, is that we're making sure that this issue is at the top of our agenda and the top of our discussion and not hidden somewhere um, where someone thinks it's someone else's problem. It's all of ours problems. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gruel. Uh, Mr. Weston, we followed by Mr. Zion. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Mr. President and members. Good morning, my dear friend. The first thing that I want to do is uh, apologize for not being able to make the press conference this morning, but uh, I had work to do in my committee and I didn't finish till almost 10 o'clock. I say that to say that I would have been there uh, because I support not just you, but this whole concept of a comprehensive approach. I have been 
in this business since I was in my 20s, and I will not say how old I am today. And I've seen the, 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 the victims, their mothers, their fathers, and it seems like it, once you, you get a handle on it in one area, it opens up in a, another area. So to attack it this way makes sense to me. And I can't think of a better person than Ms. Rice to lead, to lead this effort. She has put in work for a long time and has demonstrated her ability to tackle difficult challenges. The team, the team that you've put behind you is excellent. I'm proud I have a relationship with Bill and, and, and Blinky that Tony Cardenas introduced me to. And as I look at the other list of people that, were that are going to participate, we might have a shot here. I can't think of anything negative that will come out of the work that you will be doing. I can only see the possibility of us coming up with some original ideas, some solid approaches, so that we can try to save our young people. So many of them just afforded to break. Their whole life would be different today. When you talk to the young men and the young women that are in prison, their lives would be different today. And the last thing I do want to say, even though he stepped out of the room, this is not a popular item for Mr. Tony Cardenas. He has a track record of working on these issues. And I'm proud that I was with him and had an opportunity to vote on AB 1913, which was very critical where related to funding uh, throughout this uh, uh, region. So anyway, I rise to say that I'm a big supporter. I can't wait until you actually start working. I know that we're gonna save lives. This is, a, 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 I think, the beginning of something great. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Zahn. Thank you, Mr. President. You are a incredible person, let me say that. I know the different programs you've worked on. Uh, the civil rights issues, the law enforcement issues, uh, your credentials are without question superior. And when I looked at this, coming from a law enforcement perspective, we've been playing patchwork for so long. Just the quilt. We patch this, we patch that, we think this is going to work, that's going to work, and it's been a whole hodgepodge. And we know from history they haven't worked. And I remember the council member Martin Ludlow who started this, who wanted to get this off the ground. And I wanted to just mention his name in a positive fashion that he's the one that came around to say let's do something to try and put a lid, try to come up with something positive. I'm fully supportive. I uh, viewed the news conference earlier with you, uh, Bill Rosendahl, uh, Tony Cardenas, and, uh, and Blinky Rodriguez. I know Blinky from the good work he does out in the community. Clearly, we have a generation that is lost. Clearly, we have millions and millions of dollars that are going to different programs with negative results. And what I find this to be is hopefully a solution where we'll take the dollars that we're going to invest and invest them in programs that are worthy of investment versus the quilt patchwork that's been a history. And they're all with good intentions because everyone comes up with a solution. But now we're going to have a comprehensive view, a comprehensive report to say this works, this doesn't work, and what we go with invest our money so we can help the generations that are going down the wrong tracks. And I know from a law enforcement experience, the economic areas of the city of Los Angeles, the uneducated areas of the city of Los Angeles, and they fall in line with gangs and violence. Uh, the dysfunctional family environment, single mothers trying to work and raise the children, and the grandmothers getting involved. And it, it, it's a problem that is causing such negativity to this city that we can turn around and have a positive fashion. I have one technical question for you. Reading the report, it talks about a six-month project and saying that it's going to be too short a period of time and asking for a report back in two months. Can you expound upon that, the actual time you think it's going to take to actually complete what your mission is on this particular project? Yes, Councilman Zion, thank you uh, for your leadership on these issues as well, more from the law enforcement end. But um, I've enjoyed working with you, and uh, thank you for the, for the comments. Um, yes, this six-month timeline is a problem. I'm not going to sit up here and say it isn't. But we've been very honest with the ad hoc committee about what we can deliver and what we cannot deliver. 
At the first two months, we can tell you what our assessment of what currently is going on, where that is. We can give you a status report. We have no final reports. And I don't want to give interim reports because they get affected by right. information that you discover down the line. So we can give a status report probably in time for s perhaps some impact on whether you want to extend the six months and provide more money with the new fiscal year. Um, in six months' time, we can give you an outline of the issues, what we know and what we don't know. We cannot give you a full road map, but we've already told the Ad Hoc Committee that. In six months' time, we will, however, give you the, the outline and the chart of where you need to go from there. And in each of the areas that we've promised in our proposal, we will deliver on them. But they will not be as full and as complete if we, as if we had more time. That's, that's just a given. So we're going to take an assessment. Uh, Council, Councilman Cardenas has said in that we'll, we'll go as we go. We'll, we'll take an evaluation as we go. And we'll show you what we're producing for the money that you're spending right now. And you can decide whether you want to continue. Well, I'm sure it'll be money well invested. I have one more comment. Uh, there's a man that I met through Jim Hill, the Channel 2 sportscaster, a man who spent half his life in prison. He's in his 40s now, spent half his life in many of the prisons in California. Uh, when this came about, and I'd spoken with Martin about that, he wants to get involved to show that side. Where I've spent time in prison, he's now got a job, he's now, and his wife has stuck with him the whole time, and she's an angel to do that. He wants to get involved and do something to help. In fact, he sent a letter recently, he wants to go to the county jail and help stem some of the problems. He's Latino, but he knows the problems from the inside. Would an individual like that be of assistance with you in this type of endeavor? Not at this phase right now. Okay. That kind of individual is absolutely critical to more of the implementation phases where you start getting the intelligence to design specific programs. This is more of the assessment and the charting of the map that we need. It's a blueprint. The folk who have lived these issues are absolutely vital to this enterprise. And we have experts who have been in prison and so forth who are part of the team. But if we had to call everybody who's who wants to help, that takes a much bigger infrastructure and it, it, it's more of the grassroots intelligence gathering that I think comes at a later phase. I'm more than open to that and I can, I can take people's input even at this stage, but I think it needs to have a, a comprehensive, in-depth engagement at the grassroots level, but you're not going to get that in six months. Okay, right. So, but, but, but you're absolutely right. That we have PhDs. We have folk who, who are, you know, flown to Beijing to give speeches. They've got so much, they've got alphabet soup after their, they're the Ivy League experts. We also have our street experts. Right. And these are people who have been in these gangs, have been in the prisons, are now out of them, and are very brave. I've watched these guys take Glock 9s from teenagers at 2 o'clock in the morning after a shooting. And they are critical, and, and Councilman Cardenas has worked uh, a lot with them as well. Bill Martinez has. They are an, they are an incredibly important phalanx and, and, and a front in this war. But at this stage, it's going to be a select set of experts so we can move quickly. Okay. Thank you. But they will be in there. And anybody that you want us to work with, we need you to designate people in your offices to work with us so that everybody in your district, we are directly engaged with even at this stage. Um, that, that's a promise that I'm making to each council person, is that the people you work with on these issues, we will immediately engage with. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. I know it's in good hands with your leadership. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Wiesar, to be followed by Mr. Reyes. Thank you, Mr. President. Let me, uh, to join the chorus in thanking you, Ms. Rice, for the work you've done, and also in uh, saying uh, that this is certainly long overdue, what we're embarking on here today. And as you mentioned, uh, some of these intractable problems are really fixable if we focus and get our minds to it and get uh, people who know the issue together to get it done. You use the example of the school district where for 30 years we didn't build any schools and we opened up 50 new schools in the last two years, the most schools ever opened probably in the history of the world. Um, and um, when I look at the reality of this, and just last week, a couple of days ago in, in my district, there was an unfortunate homicide uh, between two rivaling gangs and uh, the, the human um, element that we're talking about, uh, it really hits home uh, and it, it's probably a lot larger uh, for many of us who don't encounter the, uh, the effects not only to those involved in this activity but as innocent third party uh, citizens. Um, it's a reality out there that people are living with each and every day. And when we ask ourselves uh, what are we doing 
as people responsible to provide the safety necessary for either the youth involved or adults involved in these activities or innocent people, we're not doing an adequate job. Uh, so I want to thank uh, the ad hoc committee, uh, uh, the chair, Gardenas, for embarking on this. And I do have one question that I need clarified. And in the evaluation of the programs, do you intend to come back to us with the actual evaluation of all the programs we have, or will you be setting out indicators or a model of how the city can go about in evaluating the number of programs we have here? Councilman Reeser, th thank you, and uh, uh, I think it's the second time I've addressed you since you, congratulations. Uh, and your leadership, having come from the school district, is going to be absolutely critical because the schools are a center of the solution. Uh, our, our schools do not function at a level that helps this problem help solve this problem and, and we're going to be looking to your help and figuring out how we get LA Unified to step up to the plate better. Um, we, we, in six months you cannot even do a proper evaluation of a large program. So it's going to be the latter two. It's going to be listing the current evaluations, the adequacy of those evaluations. What do they ask that's right and what don't they ask that's right. Some of the evaluations that have been done aren't even real evaluations. They are simply accounting of how many meetings happen. That's not an evaluation. Or so a list of names of people who participated. A list of names, that is not an evaluation. Program, this, yes. we, but part of what we're going to be asked, we have people who are expert in program evaluation, all kinds of program evaluation. And we will, what we will do is we will show you what the issues are. Why is it so hard to evaluate these programs? Why don't we have a good evaluation system? Why is it all over the map? And why, don't you, why aren't the questions that you want answered being answered? Then we can propose evaluation to be built into new programs and to be woven into existing programs so that you actually get much better evaluation. The ad hoc committee has tried for a year to get a response to the evaluation of current programs. They had a very hard time doing it, and what they got back was not adequate. But that is something that we will describe as a problem. We will diagnose the problem, and we will tell you what the issues and the questions are and what you need to know to be able to design the right kind of evaluation. But you can't actually do a proper evaluation of even one program in six months, never mind the, the city's entire uh, uh, programs. Thank you. And uh, Council President, if you permit me just a, a few seconds. And I wanted to point that out for two reasons. Number one is that we've got to realize that what we're undertaking here is moment, I mean, it's huge, that we then need to, need to take the step after that to do the actual evaluation of these programs. And when I look at uh, certain programs coming to me to fund them in my district or to help them get funding from the city, and I ask about evaluations and there's no real evaluations, I want to help them and support them because we need to get this done. But we really are under uh, uh, an urgent matter to really uh, have the city uh, focus on evaluating these programs so that we are making good decisions on what programs are working or not. And this is just a, a step, a baby step, a very good one, an important one, but the real crux is going to be those programs that do exist here now doing the actual evaluation and then facing the political reality that even our friends who are not doing a good job we have to make that tough decision to get that service to these kids and adults who need it. Thank you, Absolutely, Councilman. I would just add one thing. Sometimes it's not a matter of the current programs not performing. Yeah, yeah. It's asking someone with a, with a scoop to empty the ocean. The programs that you have may well be doing what they do as well as they can do it given their resources. But to ask a program that services a couple of hundred kids or 2,000 children to solve the gang problem, that's your problem. You're asking them to do what they cannot do. So sometimes it's not just whether the program is working, it's whether we put too much on these programs a Mission Impossible. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Reyes, and then Mr. Cardenas to close. Thank you, Council President. Colleagues, many of us have gone to those press conferences where we've had a shooting. We have the mother and father there crying because of what happened to their son or their daughter. There was a year in which we had parents coming here talking about wanting to raise the reward to find those people that had killed their son or daughter. As a result of those efforts, the former chair of this, of this committee, the ad hoc on gangs, myself and other members of that committee said, the city has to change how it views this issue. This cannot be a subset of another department. This can be a marketing ploy for another department. 
It can be a public relations uh, donation to this issue. It has to be a focus that creates a priority in how we invest our dollars in our youth, how we create jobs, how we look at social service programs, how we allot the millions of dollars to all these programs we have that have no connection, no link, no focus on how we change the sense of hope and self-esteem of our young people who get sucked into the subculture of gangs, drug trading, prostitution, and everything else that goes with that lifestyle. It is not a priority of this city. It is not. As I look at this language here, the first condition is availability of funds to do this report. How can we say that? We should demand, we should have this as a priority, we should fund this, we should find a way to fund this, and not leave it to that ambiguous state depending on availability of funds. We should change that in this report. I'd like to amend this report and take that out and say this will be funded. Now, folks, we've been working hard on trying to figure out a solution. We know we're dealing with, if I could just bear a few more seconds, we need to figure out how we make this a priority in every executive, every department head in the city, and we need to come to conclusions as a result of this study whether we actually form a department whose sole purpose is to create jobs and recycle our resources into the neighborhoods so that the gangs don't have a chance to flourish, to actually start giving young people an option. Many of young people do not have an option. So it cannot be an afterthought. It can't be a gesture. It has to be real action. So I want to thank Ms. Rice because I believe she's setting the parameters. The reports we got the other day was very, very disappointing, sickening, and reflected the culture of this city's bureaucracy, that the gang issue is an afterthought. The gang issue is their problem. The gang issue will always be here. Why worry about it? Let's create Band-Aids. We cannot afford the Band-Aids anymore. 93,000 is the estimated figure of young people who are no longer in high school, considered dropouts. There's no record of them. But you'll find them in our jails, you'll find them in our prisons, and you'll find them in our rehab centers, you'll find them in the streets and the corners figuring out what they're going to do the next day to get by. So again, folks, this is real. I would like to submit a friendly amendment that we fund this, that we do not depend on that language, availability of funds. It has to be a priority, and I'd like to get a second on that amendment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Reyes. Mr. Garcetti. Thank you very much, Madam President. I wasn't going to speak, colleagues, but um, Mr. Reyes inspired me to, to say a couple things about this council and to share a couple thoughts, which I'll also follow up with privately uh, with Ms. Rice. Um, colleagues, we have an immense amount of talent around this horseshoe and an immense amount of passion. And Mr. Reyes, I always say, is the conscience on so many issues of this council, but certainly um, as we look at youth opportunity, um, he's somebody whose voice throughout Northeast Los Angeles, but for the entire city, always uh, is like a siren call to us for action. Mr. Cardenas, uh, I was very happy to appoint as chair to this committee because the experience he brings from the state, having led um, with a number of leaders, and I know my, my own father was involved in this quite a bit, on juvenile justice reform to have a more humane and better approach to how we deal with human beings, um, not the criminal justice system, but human beings who intersect uh, with that system um, was something that I think began to change the language of years and years of tide. It was just about suppression and speaking about suppression with very little about investing in people. Ms. Perry, who has gone to funerals and paid for funerals out of her own um, money for young people who have been shot. Mr. Villaragosa, who has showed up at midnight uh, and 2 a.m. for shootings in his own district. Um, each one of us Mr. Parks and Mr. Zine, their experience in law enforcement, uh, feeling and touching that perhaps in a more immediate way. Mr. Smith is a reserve officer as well than most of us. Um, and then each one of us can share those stories, those human tragedies. Um, for me, it was 13 young people killed uh, in a two-month period around 9-11 in North Atwater Village, um, in which never made the paper because it was gang-related. It was not important enough. Um, the way that Mr. Rosendahl said it touches the west side of Los Angeles. We know the San Fernando Valley had for some time a rise in gang violence. 
All of us feel this in our bones, and I know Chief Gascon was just here a second ago, but it was interesting talking to Chief Bratton recently and a number of the captains in my own district that they're saying, we're kind of hit the wall. We can't really do much more in crime prevention using traditional means. We've added bodies, but we can't add many more because of hiring um, that other folks are doing in the drop program. We can't keep adding much more money to that bucket without finding uh, new resources. We can only ask so much overtime uh, from each officer. So now it's really incumbent upon us to drive those crime statistics down and not to do it just by saying that our arrest rates are up and that we have more people in jail, but by saying that we have richer and stronger communities and young people having different opportunities. Um, I think, Ms. Rice, it has to be a hybrid of all of those models you mentioned. It has to be a public health crisis and building on groups like Operation Ceasefire in, in Chicago that said, you know, there was poverty and a lack of jobs in the 60s, but it wasn't as acceptable to take a gun and to shoot people, that that's a piece of it. Um, that when we look at young people, though, nevertheless, that don't have jobs, and we know in Atwater Village the only thing that stemmed those 13 killings was when two-thirds of the gang um, up there in Tunerville was able to become or learn to become U.S. Forest Service firefighters and to have at least some, some seasonal work that began to give them a vision of something more than killing one another um, or being violent to one another. It has to be also continuing smart suppression but not letting that pollute in to the prevention and intervention. And having been chair for the last four and a half years of the Housing, Community and Economic Development Committee, which I'm so proud of the work that Mr. Wesson's already doing there as well, um, I've seen that we have constituencies for each one of these programs. What we don't have is constituency for a coherence overall. And I'm over time and I want to abide by my, my own rules that say. I ask you to. So I will <laughs> say in conclusion, the one seed that I would plant, uh, Ms. Rice, is help us and colleagues, we must do this ourselves, help ourselves right now give coherence to the programs that we have because there is none. So we can say that this one is great, the YO, we can say that CDD, LA Bridges some, too, is sometimes doing great things. We can say that LA's Best is doing great things, but we have, inst instead of creating coherence, we have constituted uh, constituencies, and that has to end. So um, I want to just thank my colleagues for their leadership and Mr. Cardenas um, for chairing this and seeing through what is going to be one of the toughest things that we ever do. Thank you, Mr. Garcetti. Uh, to close, Mr. Cardenas. Thank you very much. I'd like to clarify uh, the need or, or to maybe change that amendment by Mr. Reyes. I agree with you 100 percent, Councilmember Reyes, that we should not uh, allow such a process to be thwarted if they say, well, we did everything and we came at the end of the rope when it comes to money and therefore we can't either finish it or we can't continue to uh, give the proper advice uh, to the city. So with that, uh, the mechanism within this process is that uh, the team is going to be uh, giving us updates uh, throughout the process and, and in that opportunity they will be able to let us know how it's going, they'll be able to justify how they've gotten to where they're at and if there is a need for more funding they'll be able to tell us that and we can evaluate that at that moment and I feel very confident that with the spirit of what's been going on so far that we're, we're going to want them to continue. As a matter of fact, we had that discussion about time and money uh, when we were evaluating this in the committee. So with that, I would uh, ask you if you could withdraw your motion because already inherent in this is the opportunity for that justification to come about. And we've already said in committee that we do not want to thwart this process uh, based on time or money. We want it to be done properly. As long as it's on the record, as long as it's on the record that we're not going to in any way shortchange or make this a secondary issue because of lack of funds, just the verbiage here, the availability of funds is the number one condition, uh, just raised big, uh, great concern on my part. So I appreciate that clarification. Uh, this should be of highest priority and we should find the money to make this happen and continue in a process that reflects the quality and the sacrifice that's being done by our gang intervention teams in making these kinds of uh, programs real. So I appreciate and, that clarification. And point, point of Ms. Rice, can you please comment on, on if you feel as though the process as we've laid it out to you of evaluating and giving us updates, if that would allow that opportunity for you to dialogue with us in that fashion. My time, please. Yes, we, it, okay. we can make it work. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's important for us to understand, colleagues, and I, I, I thank you, uh, uh, Councilmember Wesson, former speaker, that you were very supportive of what we did in Sacramento when it came to gang prevention and intervention. And one thing I'd like to, to point out for all of you Angelinos, taxpayers, is that 
When we did that at the state level and we required outcomes of every program for them to evaluate every single year, what we found is we're spending on average about $1,300 per program per youth to get them to stay away from gangs, to get them on the right path. And yet at the same time, the state of California, with those same tax dollars, is spending 90 plus thousand dollars per youth to incarcerate them. And I would say, to be able to evaluate our outcomes, to be able to be honest with ourselves, is the right prudent thing to do with our tax dollars. And I think it's important for us to follow through with that here at the city level. Also, I'd like to take a moment to thank my colleagues on the, on the policy process to get it to this point. I want to thank you for bringing this good product here where we have today. And also, I'd also like to give uh, just credit and due credit to Martin Ludlow. When he was on the council, he was the one who asked count, then Council President Alex Padilla to start it at this ad hoc committee, of which this is only one component of the fruit of the labor of that committee and of this council. So I'd like to thank Martin Ludlow as well. I'd wa I'd like to end with this, uh, council members, that I point out to you. There is not a politician who's run for office, who have been elected to office, who didn't say at one time or other, in some fashion or other, that are, they are going to be tough on crime. Because that is the right way to be, the right place to be. But I think that it's important for us to understand that in order to get tough on crime, we have to be tough with the programs that we're responsible for. And we have to hold them accountable. And this is the most comprehensive way that we've been able to come about to be able to do that here in this city. And when I say the most comprehensive way, not just for the city of Los Angeles, but for the entire country. I think what we have before us is an opportunity to create a blueprint for the city of Los Angeles where we hold ourselves accountable dollar for dollar, program by program, Program, and at the same time, give that example to other cities and other counties throughout the country. And as, for example, San Diego is already looking to us, the city of Los Angeles. They've called me to go to their council meeting in the near future because they're trying to embark on this same process. And they've been looking at us and we're a step ahead of them. So we have a lot to be responsible for in this city and a lot of responsibility and accountability. And I think we're doing the right thing. I urge your I vote. Thank you very much. Mr. Ace, did you want to speak in or you had that clarified? Okay. And as a point of clarification on uh, information, I know the motion we put forward, Mr. Reyes, addresses the funding on the 15 percent of uh, what we spend on policing in the city as well uh, per Measure A, so that should address some of those concerns. Okay. Um, please open the roll on this item. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. 13 ayes. That is approved. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Ms. Reyes. Next item, please. Next item is item 12, and that was called special by Council Member Zine. Mr. Zine, item number 12. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. If I can have the uh, personnel department and the fire department come forward on this matter. This is regarding emergency medical services educator exemption. Uh, traditionally, this would go to personnel committee, and my first question is, why didn't it go to personnel committee? Who wants to answer that question? Uh, Victor Ballesteros, uh, personnel department staff. Uh, we, we have no control over the scheduling of the items. Uh. Who does? Whose responsibility is to set it for a committee? Because that's where we do this, not in the full council, but normally in committee. So the, the question city, is, the why did it go to the, the city? It's our understanding that the city clerk went ahead and, and um, scheduled it for uh, for council meeting. All right. So the city. I don't have the specifics as to the reasons why. That, that would go through my office as well, Mr. Zine. I'll inquire right now as to why that happened. Okay, because it just moves the process along quicker when we could do this in committee instead of taking up the time of the full council. I understand. But when we come with personnel issues, we're always concerned as to the specifics. Uh, on this particular situation, uh, what type of person are they looking for? Because it states management services, professional, scientific, expert services of exceptional character. So what type of person are they looking for for this position? The technical qualifications of the position is a uh, person of a nurse or paramedic background that has experience in the pre-hospital, what would be commonly referred to as emergency, uh, pre-hospital emergency uh, medical care. And that would be, uh, for instance, paramedic that is a uh, working paramedic or a registered nurse that has experience in an emergency room or coordinating pre-hospital care for a hospital. 
So how do we find this person? Because we want to make an exemption. How do we then locate this individual? Uh, we have to advertise, and uh, we have uh, thus far uh, done a advertisement. Uh, we have uh, received resumes and are looking at those at this time and uh, preparing for uh, this process that we're doing today. If you just hold my time, um, and how many do we have in this particular category? We have a total of four. Three of them are presently filled. This is a vacancy that has uh, recently uh, occurred, and so now we are trying to refill the fourth position. And they're all exempt positions? Uh, yes, they are. Okay. How do we then decide to make them a civil service classification? We have nurse practitioners, we have paramedics, EMTs. How do we fold this into that process for a promotional process within the civil service for our city employees? Uh, it would have to be a, and I'm not the expert here, so maybe I should actually turn it over to personnel. Because if we're looking at our paramedics, we're looking at our nurse practitioners, we're looking at the qualified people that we have within the city family for a promotional process for this particular position to uh, keep our paramedics, uh, fire personnel trained as required by state law. Uh, I'm George Springer from the personnel department. Um, in order to bring these these positions under civil service, give them civil service protection, um, it would be necessary for the fire department to request an exam, uh, civil service exam, and you know we we would be in a position to, to conduct an exam for that uh, for this class if 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 we get the request from the appointing authority. Well, see, the question then is, we're not we're not given an exam, we're hiring people to fill a position without an exam. How are we filling that criteria? How are we finding out the qualifications if we're not testing these individuals? We put out a search for an individual who's got this expertise, but we're not testing them, but we're given a position to train people. How does that connect? Uh, what the process has been to fill all four of the positions uh, previous is that uh, we advertise, then we do a resume review. Uh, part of our panel, internal panel that does that resume review is the department doctor, Dr. Eckstein. Uh, our other nurse, uh, edu nurse educators, as well as fire department EMS staff. So those are the people that do the resume review, and then following resume review, then they uh, are provided a interview process of which we have medical experts from within the department on to talk about their uh, work history, qualifications, and suitability to be uh, educators for the department. Okay, I, I just have some concerns that we do these exempt positions, we uh, bypass the civil service system, yet we find people that are qualified to fill those positions, and I look at that promotional process within the civil service ranks. I know we have nurse practitioners that are in the jails, we have RNs, we have LVNs, we have all these different categories, we have MDs, uh, and it seems interesting that we don't have a category, since it's a necessary category required by state law, that we would have that as part of the system. And I'll have my staff deal with the personnel department on that. I want to make it fair and open to everyone. So it's not, you know, special select people get these jobs and other people are excluded. I want to make it fair across the board. And that's basically what the civil service system does. And that's what we do in personnel committee, is give everyone an opportunity that has the qualifications for that process. The person who left, uh, how long were they there and why'd they leave? Uh, they were there for approximately uh, six months. Uh, they were, uh, had a medical issue. And so they've been gone approximately three years. So that spot's been vacant for three years? Uh, correct. Okay. In the future, uh, if you could tell the appropriate folks to have it sent to committee. So we, we can, we've uh, found out, Mr. Zahn, what happened. It was the, the city clerk's office inadvertently referred it to public safety and not directly to personnel as well uh, as personnel. And because there's 10 days to act and it didn't move out of public safety in time, um, 10 days, if we don't take action, it's approved. So this is our only chance to actually comment on it otherwise, or the 10 days would have expired. But I've been assured that mistake won't happen again. Okay, thank you all. Thank you. Okay, uh, that finishes our speakers. Um, if we can please prepare the roll on the item and tabulate the vote. 13 ayes. That is approved. Uh, next item, please. Item number 22, call special by council member uh, Perry, and there are cards on this item also. Okay. Ms. Perry, would you like to start with the cards on this? Yes, thank you very much. Okay. Yes. All right. Uh, now open a public hearing for 10 minutes on this. We have a number of cards, so I would just ask uh, folks that are here, you have up to two minutes each, but in order to get to more than five people, um, you don't have to use all 
of those two minutes to speak. Brenda Wilson will be our first speaker, be followed by John Campbell, um, Alfred G. Green, uh, Jr. Incorporated, and Tobias Renero, the Renfro, excuse me, Renfro, will be our first speakers. Ms. Wilson? Good morning, uh, council members. Brenda Wilson, CEO, President of New Image Emergency Shelter. And um, two minutes, goodness. I need much more time. Um, we are here today, uh, New Image is, and um, because of the concern with the uh, funding shortfall, uh, several of our clients that will be affected by this in terms of uh, being turned away as of March the 15th are here with concerns. New Image, could you please stand all those, the clients from New Image Emergency Shelter? They're very concerned, yeah. Uh, we do appreciate that, uh, I do understand that there may be funds that will be made available for this, but we have unfortunately 500 clients at one facility, 150, 175 in another. Uh, to go down to 400 beds is going to be very difficult. New Image is your largest provider of uh, temporary emergency shelter services in, in this state of California. And um, we currently have a computer learning center. Uh, we have grown. The clients are very, very busy in accessing services. Uh, the first of its kind uh, of computer learning center uh, within the shelter, which has helped us tremendously to mainstream um, well over with that assistance, 4,000 out of more than 11,000 uh, clients that were mainstreamed and, and served uh, through the year 2005. We want to continue to do this. We are concerned about the men that are going to be displaced because we are forced to bring 200 women back to the shelter, our 400 bed shelter. So this means 250 to 300 of our men will have to find a new home as of March the 15th, several of which are working and New Image is their home because they can't afford housing. There's, I have 12 case managers, but unfortunately the lack of affordable housing and transitional housing has made it difficult for placement. Thank you very much, Ms. Wilson. John Campbell. Good morning. Uh, I recently moved to this great city on January the 5th. I came here to spend my life building a church in Hollywood. I spent the last two months searching for a building and staying at a hotel on Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood. And right now, uh, as of two days ago, I ran out of money and here I am. So I just want to thank you for making this uh, safety net available and ask you to continue to do so. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Campbell. Alfred uh, G. Green, Jr. Yes. Incorporated, <laughs> or Inc. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, I pull duty under the United Nations. I'm a general engineer. Uh, I was asked to do inspections. Uh, I looked at the emergency situation and I found shelters are a great need in those that want to volunteer, especially soldiers who come home from duty. And they're laying around and they really want to get involved back into their personal life. I asked them to pick up their passport personally. They don't have to go overseas or anything, but you can be online to do any assisting. We do have uh, accommodations for that in, in, uh, at my duty station. And so I. Personally, I did my four-year tour, and I'm on a six-year tour since I'm a reservist. So I have two years down, so I was at home, so I volunteered. And I've been going, I got, you know, a little bit more time, but I've been recalled for aerospace. So I'm looking forward into, I volunteer for this particular shelter, New Image, uh, as a safety monitor so I can better acquaint myself with the situation of the problem in the city, state, county, town, and personal. Uh, the involvement that I, I see, it, it does need the help from the small business cartel, and um, I'm going to speak to a few of uh, my associates to see if we can uh, do something to try to better the situation. Thank you very much. I appreciate your testimony. Uh, Tobias Renfro, and then Adrian Jefferson. I, uh, 
been in New Image since November. Um, I'm going through a garnishment right now, and I'm unable to afford housing. Um, since I've been there, I've noticed that uh, I've seen people come in homeless and end up getting jobs there. Um, like she said, they have a library, a computer room, and it's keeping me pretty busy so I don't have to be on the street. Um, I wish you guys can keep it funded so people like me can have a place to stay. Not using it for a crutch, it's only temporary. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Adrian Jefferson's our next speaker. Then Marcel, sorry, Marcel Smith. Well, um, I was passing by. I'm an international, and um, I was, I'm from Ball Heights area, and I'm constantly traveling around all over the place. And um, I just recently, recently got through a, uh, you know, a real bad divorce. My ID was lost in the process, and I'm foreign out here. I was born in Mexico, so um, <clears throat> these homeless shelters all around Southern California are really helping out me out to me uh, get on my feet and everything else. Um, let's see. The funding is really helping out. And if uh, you can provide some more funding, that'd be really good. <clears throat> um, the new image shelter, they're asking for uh, those who uh, like to stay at that shelter to come forward and ask if you can provide some more resources. Um, I have here a list that probably might help out here um, where funding would help towards, I guess, the new image. Um, case management to help us get jobs and housings, rehabilitation and other referral services. and it would Computer resource centers, it would, to help uh, us obtain employment skills, build resumes, seek employment, contact family members through email, and refer us to different employment agencies. Uh, the libraries, literacy centers, provides reading materials to us in a quiet setting so that we can relax and study. Um, Medical services provides us with medical services with free prescription programs at the shelter sites and referrals. I'm going to go ahead and uh, let you guys make the important decision there. Thank you. We appreciate your testimony very much. Uh, Marcel Smith is next, and then Michael Bradley. Good morning, everybody. Uh, what I want to say is. Uh, it's very brief. Um, I started coming to the uh, homeless shelter. I was referred by a lady that I was trying to get uh, housing from, but it, uh, I ended up coming there. But thank God I have somewhere to lay my head. By all means, um, I do work. Um, and as far as uh, anything is uh, concerned, uh, Resource um, Work Center inside of New Image. Um, still trying to find more work, uh, whereas I'm trying to find a second job and housing. So I think being there has helped me a lot too, because um, I stay busy myself. But at the same time, I think um, you know that I'm, I have somewhere to lay my head. I have somewhere I can go and eat. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's, it's a very big help being there. Um, and also, uh, I like to say, uh, another thing that, um, is that, um, a lot of people don't always have homes to go to. They don't have uh, family. Some of them have families, but don't. Some families don't want them around. 
So I really think for I'm really thankful that there are shelters that keep people uh, from getting wet in the rain or being kicked around, you know, being kicked around or whatever or whatnot. And uh, thank you very much. We appreciate your testimony. Uh, Michael Bradley is next. We have about a minute 25 left. I'm going to be very um, brief. Uh, new images are a uh, uh, last uh, bastion or oasis for us that are homeless. This is it. And you know how cold it has been recently and how wet it has been recently. And that's rare for Cal for Los Angeles, you know. But uh, it's a godsend. And we hope you can find any kind of funding you can find for this. We'll be, uh, we'll appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have Robert Thompson. Robert Thompson here. Otis O'Connor. Otis, okay, we'll make sure we have accommodations for you, sir. Mr. O'Connor is coming around. After Mr. O'Connor, we have two other cards. And then we'll hear from members of the City Council. If our sergeants at arms can. We have a cordless microphone too, if you if you prefer. We can a handheld one that you can use. Yeah, right that probably better. be better. There you go. Okay. Good morning. Uh, it's on. Go ahead. Uh, how's everybody doing this morning? Good, sir. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, I wanted to say, as far as being put out on the streets, that's not going to affect myself, but it will affect quite a few guys I see every day. Most of these guys couldn't be here today because they have jobs. These guys have to have a place to go at night. Unfortunately, if we close down, they're not gonna have it because they don't get in until six, seven, eight at night. That's when they get off work. And by that time, we'll be full. If we have to close the winter part, or winter shelter part down and put the women back in, those guys are gonna be out on the street. They'll be walking around all night long. I feel that what we have right now is the best possible scenario that we can come up with unless we get a bigger facility. And I would appreciate it if we could keep it up. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Our, our next speaker is Sylvia Hawkins. And then our final one is Linda Moran. Ms. Hawkins. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Ms. Sylvia Hawkins. Uh, dealing with number 22, uh, we must say no. I do believe that we can't give favoritism to shelters, sex offenders, or homeless men. Dealing with our yearly budget of $1.7 billion that is now running out for all shelters and staff workers, there is no more coupons or programs assistance at this time. We must remember that all shelters are only a stepping stone to their next avenue place of living. Since 80% of all homeless shelters are men's, we cannot continue to handicap them to keep them codependent on assistance year by year. We have now ran out of any kind of help for beds, food, medication, or any kind of assistance to renew a four-year plan for year-around shelters. Thank you very much. My name is Ms. Sylvia Hawkins. Thank you very much, uh, Linda Moran, and also John Logan. Mm -hmm. Chair, council members, and community people, um, I know I look a little bit like somebody else that was here. I'm not her, however, OK? Um, I just wanted to, oh, my name is Linda Moran. I'm Dep Deputy Director of New Image Emergency Shelter. You know, uh, Ms. Wilson did share with you that we, we um, have provided jobs, housing, 
Uh, I could go on and on with the case management services that we have, in fact, uh, provided um, to the tune of roughly 33 percent of the duplicated. But what she didn't share with you that we have also served over 200 um, bed nights, and I think that's important for you to know just the value of the emergency shelters. Um, all the speakers that have come prior um, have also indicated very important points um, why, of course, there's a need for uh, homeless uh, shelters, which I think we all kind of know. But before I step away, I'd like for you to travel just a little bit with me. Um, and I just want to, in summary, uh, just share with you what we feel our major dilemma is. You've heard it, and I, ho I hope I'm not beating a dead horse here, and we appreciate all your continued support. But our dilemma is, is and I'm going to say this as briefly as possible in like 40 seconds, that presently we do have up to 200 women in a year-round shelter, I mean, in, in a winter shelter program that's going to be closing on the 15th. We have a contracted number of 400 in our year-round shelter. Now, those, the, the 200 bed sh uh, shelter, it's women. And so quite naturally, we're going to move the women back to the year-round shelter, which means that we will be displacing about 250 to 300 men. And that is our concern at this point. So we ask if you could just travel with us on March the 16th, and let's see what happens with those 250 men. And again, thank you for all your help. Thank you. John Logan, our last speaker. Good morning, Mr. Garcetti, council members. My name is Attorney John Michael Logan. I am U.S. Air Force Attorney retired. The reason I'm here is I want to bring light to this council about the concept of not funding the program as the twins ask. In reality, 250 men will be displaced, which will leave 250 men to walk your streets. And when you leave 250 homeless men out on the streets, naturally the crime goes up, the victim rate goes up. In reality, and the bottom line is, excuse me, you can either help with the funding to keep the year-round shelter open, or you will spend the funding in repairing these people through your emergency hospital, through your police investigations, through all means that the city has. It's in your hands which way you want to spend your money. And with that, I thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Logan. That closes our public comment. We appreciate all folks who came down here for that. Ms. Perry will be our first speaker, followed by Ms. Gruel and Mr. Rosendahl. Um, before I get into my comments, and I'll press my button again for a second time, I would like to ask uh, Jerry, Mitch Jerry Miller and Mitchell Netburn to uh, come to the table, if that's all right with you, Mr. President, to just give us a, a summation of uh, where we are in terms of the funding what the next few weeks portend and what our options are, and then I will press my button again, if that's what you would like. Sure, I can hold, hold your time. My time. I'll just I'll hold, hold your my time. time then. Okay. Um, well, very briefly, what's before you on 22A is uh, is essentially half the funding um, that will be required to keep the, the the beds open, or at least a portion of the beds open, um, uh, through the end of the the uh, fiscal year. Uh, it's $880,000, roughly, uh, that we're fronting from the Housing Trust Fund. Um, we'll be coming back to you with backfilling that money either from Hackler or from other source of funding. Um, but in essence, this is half the money that would be required. Uh, Ms. Perry and her staff were able to get a commitment from, from the county uh, for the other half of the money. So essentially, what's before you is, is keeping the, the beds open through the end of the fiscal year and, and the splitting of the cost between the city and the county. Ms. Perry? Ms. Perry? Uh, Mr. Netburn, please. Um, yeah, uh, late yesterday, uh, Supervisor Burke's office actually did uh, approve the allocation of, of half the funds from county discretionary funds. Uh, it was contingent upon uh, the, the city allocating an equal amount, um, and we certainly appreciate your considering this request today and, and certainly ask that you approve it. 
Uh, just the, the one additional point I do want to make is that these will keep these 820 beds open through June 30th of 06. Uh, LASA has currently issued a request for proposals uh, for this program for the fiscal year starting July 1 of 06. Um, currently our indications are that the city uh, will be allocating about $4 million for this program, um, but that will be insufficient to keep 820 beds open th throughout the 06-07 fiscal year. Our estimates are that would require $6 million. So again, if, if this is approved, uh, we're extremely pleased that these 820 beds will s be open through June 30th, um, but if there's an intention on the city to keep it approximately the same number of beds open next fiscal year, um, the additional two million would be needed and uh, we would then appropriately make those awards uh, out of the request for proposals we currently uh, have issued and are awaiting responses back to. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Nettenberg and Mr. Miller. Um, uh, colleagues, I just want to highlight a few points. First of all, I want to thank the residents of New Image for coming down here today and speaking so articulately. <laughs> and uh, putting a face with a name so that you understand the ramifications of our actions as we deliberate today. There's two sources of funding for emergency homeless uh, shelter programs. The first source is CDBG that funds the cold, wet weather program in LA County from December the 1st to March the 15th. This program serves 2,700 people. This number includes the 820 year-round beds in the city of Los Angeles. The second portion of the Emergency Homeless Shelter Program, or the 820 year-round beds, are funded through a general fund obligation in the City of Los Angeles. So you understand this program has already moved over 3,000 homeless people into better living situations in the past two years. So it's clear and well documented that this program is capable of saving lives, but there is a gap of $1.7 million for this portion of the program for March the 15th through June the 30th that serves the 820 people year-round in the city of Los Angeles, and many of those people are sitting in here in this chamber right in front of you right now. So we need to identify the funding to fill the gap, and as Mr. Miller and Netburn said, Thank you to Supervisor Yvonne Burke, who has already agreed to assist us and will provide 880000 provided that the city agrees to fund the other half of the gap. So my motion asked the CLA and the CAO to identify funds to fill the gap, and I move and ask that the council adopt the CLA's recommendation. And I'm also asking all of you to make the commitment to fund our half of the obligation now so that LASA can issue the contracts for three and a half months remaining in the fiscal year and the county will then release its funds immediately. So I ask you for an I vote today. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Ms. Gruel. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Garcetti, Mr. President. And I just want to acknowledge uh, Ms. Perry for her leadership on this issue, uh, on, the, on the homeless issue, and for all the residents of the New Image Shelter um, and the twins for, for being here. Uh, I think what uh, I wanted to say, and Ms. Perry alluded to it as well, that what we have today are the faces of people who need the services. And when we, we started, and that time it was called the Cold Wet Weather Program under Tom Bradley uh, many, many years ago, uh, it was uh, the time in which you had to determine whether it was cold enough or the uh, rain prediction was enough that it was actually going to rain. Um, and although that was the first step, it, it really, I think, uh, did not go far enough, which is what we have today. Uh, we had the program that went then from November November to March, correct? Um, and under the leadership of Ms. Perry and this council, we expanded that to be a year-round shelter because uh, the homeless uh, don't just suddenly, when it's warmer weather, and uh, have another place to stay or a place to go. And if we really want to help them get into self-sufficiency, and as many of the gentlemen who spoke today are talking about, that this is their opportunity for the transition to have a place to stay while they figure out what their next step is going to be. And if we take that away from them, if we take that, um, I think, certainty of knowing that they have a place to lay their head each night, uh, then uh, we are taking away uh, their dignity and their ability to go to that next step, which is to find a job or to find another place to stay or the services that they need. And so I just want to 
say thank you. Um, uh, Many of the people know here, but I worked um, at HUD in the Clinton administration in dealing with, with homeless issues, and so it's a passion of mine uh, to, to make sure that we provide those kinds of services. So uh, thank you to the CLA and to LASA and Ms. Perry for finding the resource for us till July, uh, but that does not mean our task is not over. And there's been a lot of attention um, on the homeless issue now, which is, is critically important. But we've been there uh, in the past where we've had focus on the homeless issue in 1984 and 1994 and now in 2005. Um, and the problem is, is that it lasts only for a little bit of time where people focus on it. Um, and we have to stop that trend from happening because the homeless do not go away. Um, they only grow in numbers. It's just that our attention span, and I say the public at large, does not look at the homeless issue and figures it's gone away. We had a few articles in the paper. We had a few individuals who died. We had all these things that occurred, uh, but the attention needs to get back on focusing on the homeless. So uh, this is only one small part of what Ms. Perry and the ad hoc committee and the rest of us want to see happen in Los Angeles, is that we cannot forget those individuals um, who need our help and need our voices. Um, and today we're sending a message that we're not forgetting. We are going to fund those programs. These gentlemen um, and, and women will have a place to go not only tomorrow night, but after March 15th and a commitment by this council to be after July 1st as well. So thank you and thank you, Ms. Perry, um, and look forward to us uh, finding the additional funds to make sure these programs continue. Thank, thank you, Thank you Mr. very President. much. Mr. Rosendahl. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. First, uh, I, I want to say to the folks that are using the shelter, I'm very impressed that you came here today, and I agree um, that the shelter is a critical part of the solution dealing with homelessness. Secondly, uh, I want to thank uh, Jan Perry, who's chair of the committee, Ad Hoc Committee on Homelessness. I'm a member of that. We had our first meeting uh, last week. Uh, and in that discussion, we looked at the statistics of the situation. It is a huge challenge for us uh, to work on this issue. And we want to work on this issue, and we want to solve the issue. So number one, I support, uh, obviously, the funding of the program to continue, number one. Number two, in the long-run solution, we need permanent housing with supportive services. Uh, and I know that our chair, Jan Perry, and myself, and Eric Garcetti, who sits on the committee, our president, we're going to do everything we can over the next period of time to come up with a plan that's an L.A. City and L.A. County plan, where we all work together in solving the problem of homelessness. So I enthusiastically support this continued funding. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Rosendahl. Mr. Wesson is our next speaker. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President and uh, members. I stand for a couple of reasons. I want to say we, the 15 of us, there's so much we want to do. We just can't do it all. We have to depend on other members in this horseshoe to take the lead on certain issues. So I rise to say we're fortunate to have Jan Perry as the person that can take the lead on these issues. She, she, she feels it, she understands it, and she works hard to try to be our champion on the council, and it's a pleasure to serve with you. And thank you for doing things that maybe I can't or other members can't do as much of. Hopefully, uh, somebody will be able to say that about me where it relates to some of the things that I do. I also want to commend Supervisor Burke and Jan, your discussions with her so that the county and the city are truly trying to make a partnership here and ensure that these beds stay open until, uh, up until, what is it, July 1. But most importantly, New Image, you are super impressive. You should give your hand, yourselves a round of applause. Government has several responsibilities, but I can't think of two that are more important than the ones that I will say now. I think that government has a responsibility 
to take care of those who cannot take care of themselves. And I think that government has a responsibility to create a safety net, net and a safe environment. And I look forward to seeing you in the future as you transition on to a permanent situation, to a new life. Anything could take me and put me in the position that you're in. I'm blessed. I'm blessed to be where I am, and I hope, and with Jan's leadership, that we will be able to take you to the place where you all want to go. I wholeheartedly support this. Thank you very much, Mr. Wesson. Uh, Ms. Perry, did you want to be here another time? Or are you good? Just okay. to say thank you. All right. Hope for an I vote. Thank you, and an I vote, and I too want to reiterate from the chair, if you'll indulge me, the. Uh, thanks to New Image Shelter, where I've spent uh, many visits, and, and for your leadership in all the shelter system, and Ms. Perry, and I know worked on this over many years of continually looking for this funding, and I know we're committed to finding a permanent source for this too, and LHD, we thank them for their loan on this. Anyway, with that, if we can open up the roll, close the roll, and tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. That is approved. Thank you all very much. Mr. President, can I have that go forthwith, please? Yes, that thank will go you. forthwith. Uh, our next item is item 24, and we have a card uh, on this, so we open the public hearing. Ms. Sylvia Hawkins on item number 24. Ms. Hawkins, number 24. Uh, good morning, everyone, again. Uh, my name is Ms. Sylvie Hawkins. I did say yes on number 24. Because of the break of contract with eight different governments on September 11, 2001, Tuesday, our United States of America, Hawk War 8, predator military weapon of war already versus our churches that is getting ready to attack the United States of America states. Before disarming United States of America nuclear bomb, we will first use bombs and missiles. Our United States of America nuclear bomb negotiation is with these eight states only for United States of America and overseas which is Italy, Sweetland, New England, Australia, Mexico, China, North and South Korea, and Germany. All other states must go with President Putt, President Bush, Japan President, Prince Charles, Prime Minister Blair, President Mandela, Russia President, President of Alaska leader and Canada. These must not cross the one divided line with any trade or any visitation to United States of America. Again, I am fully persuaded that United States of America do not need any help or assistance in making any nuclear bomb with Russia. Thank you very much. My name is Ms. Sylvia Hawkins. Thank you, Ms. Hawkins, for your thoughts on uh, global disarmament. We appreciate them today. If we can open the roll. And close the roll and tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. That is approved. Um, we have a special one for us. If we can okay. have the city attorney on the findings. Or should we announce what it is, Madam Clerk? No, I was just going to say the city attorney will speak to the findings. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Madam Clerk. <laughs> Since the posting of today's agenda, the federal GSA agreed to lease extension terms due to the GSA's need to remain at the Broadway building for an additional six months. Immediate action is required due to the impending council recess and due to the need to secure the GSA's commitment in writing as soon as possible. Council must first make findings pursuant to Government Code Section 54954.2 before considering the substantive motion. Okay, anybody wishing to be heard on the findings? Seeing none, please prepare the roll on the findings and tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. Council has concluded the findings that this is indeed 
timely under Rule 23 of our rules. So with that, um, Mr. Miller, do you want to just briefly brief sure. the council? Thank uh, you. Sure. As you know, some time ago we purchased what was then called the Broadway Building. It's now going to house public works. One of those floors was occupied by the Social Security Administration, the federal government. Uh, their lease expires, uh, was supposed to expire at the end of the, this month. Uh, at the end of February. They informed us in December that they, in fact, were not ready to leave and were not going to leave. Uh, so General Services, essentially, in working with my office and the CAO uh, um, and City Attorney, uh, were scrambling around to, to try to come to some sort of a resolution on them staying for an additional six months. What you have before you is the final deal. Um, I, I want to commend General Services and City Attorney uh, for negotiating this. Essentially, we have little leverage when we're dealing with the federal government. Uh, and the, the lease costs here will more than cover the additional lease costs by leaving the Bureau of Street Services uh, um, out of the building. So essentially our costs would be covered by this. Um, it will be a delay of six months in moving them into the building. Uh, but uh, under the circumstances, I think this is an excellent deal. It's substantially above market. Uh, and, and, and the federal government was in fact very cooperative in, in trying to reach an agreement here. Thank you. Uh, anybody wishing to be heard on this? If not, let's prepare the roll and tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. That is approved and we'll go forth with on that. Any other items, Madam Clerk? Uh, council has motions for posting and referral. Those are posted and referred. The excuses on the desk, Councilmember Cardenas requests to be excused Friday, April 28th to leave at 1215 for city business. That meets council policy. Mr. Cardenas is excused. And Councilmember Parks requests to be excused Friday, March 17th to leave at 11 a.m. for city business. Motion is required. Uh, colleagues, just as a side note, some folks were wondering w when a motion is required for an excuse and not. It's if there's already only 12 members or less for the last two members, there's a motion required. So on Mr. Park's uh, excuse, Ms. Uh, Rule moves and Mr. Padilla seconds. If there's no objection, unanimous vote. And Mr. Parks is excused. And that clears the desk. Okay. Uh, announcements, colleagues. And again, we always commend uh, to our viewers the lacity.org website where there's a calendar of all sorts of events throughout our council districts in the city. Um, but other announcements, Mr. Parks? Announcement for tonight, uh, the uh, March 7, 6 p.m. at Ramona Hall in CD uh, 1 at 4580 Figueroa. We'll have our uh, special budget and finance committee meeting with our agenda, but also to listen to the public about issues they may think are priority for next year's budget. Uh, we're hopeful to get citywide attendance, but it's primarily set up for CDs 1, 4, 13, and 14. Also, to make the public aware, uh, impacts both uh, CD 1 and 8, uh, there will be a public workshop at uh, the Epic Center at uh, 3990 South Menlo on March the 11th, 10 a.m. to 2, to discuss uh, issues dealing with an upcoming uh, public hearing dealing with university off-campus housing district. That public hearing will be held Tuesday, March 14th, 6 p.m. at the Science Center in the Loker Conference Room at 700 State Drive. Uh, and this is an ordinance talking about the North uh, University housing area uh, with a uh, ordinance on, on housing. Also uh, for the 8th District, uh, the annual Junior Blind of America uh, Olympics will be held March 18th at their site at 5300 Angeles Vista. Contact number 323-295-4555. Also, 8th District will be having a disaster preparedness training on Monday, March 13th at the Constituent Center at 8475 South Vermont. Uh, contact number 323 293-9467. The time of that uh, training will be 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Thank you, Mr. Parks. Other announcements, colleagues? Um, one announcement from the chair is that we will be meeting at 9 a.m. on Friday, colleagues, for the next two Fridays, uh, this Friday the 10th, um, where we have close to a bare quorum, but we will consider the uh, disposition of our trash in the city. Um, the, a 
week later will be the final date to take any action on that. On the 17th, St. Patrick's Day, that'll also be beginning at 9 a.m. So I just want to remind members if they can come, we'll have our Friday presentations as is customary, but those will begin at 9 a.m. And for members of the public and our viewers, we will also uh, be starting the meeting then on both the 10th this week and the 17th uh, this week as well. And finally, next uh, month we will begin our regularly scheduled daytime council meetings um, in Van Nuys once a month. Uh, we will be announcing the date shortly, um, but we will meet during regular hours and we are working on a remote facility here so that members of the public can come here and testify uh, to us in Van Nuys just as we afford the uh, opportunity for people to do that today from Van Nuys to City Hall. So uh, those are the announcements. Any other announcements, Mr. Reyes? Thank you, Mr. Um, Council President. I just wanted to make sure that I uh, thank Councilor Parks for having the committee in Ramona Hall. It'll be at the second level. Uh, there's a vote today for the school board in the area. So that'll be happening at the bottom floor. Our meeting will be on the second level. We'll be accommodating the meeting, so everything should work out very well. You're thank all you. invited. Thank you, Mr. Reyes. No other announcements. If I can please ask everybody to rise for adjourning motions. Adjourning motions, members? Any, Mr. Zahn? Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Sam Chulin, one of the first Asian American network television reporters, died in Burbank on Sunday, March 5th at the age of 67. Sam had been a television radio reporter since the 60s, working for KFWB, KTLA, and since 1995, KTTV. He worked for CBS in the 70s, also wrote articles on Asian American affairs for Asian Week and the San Francisco Examiner. He has a story in the current issue of Asian Week. Sam Chulin's Asian heritage was important to him, calling journalism a chance to use your roots for a positive purpose. Sam Chulin once persuaded ABC's Nightline to produce a program titled Asian American, When Your Neighbor Looks Like the Enemy, and help book guests and find historical footage. Also won a national headliner award for the television documentary Chulin is an old American name. Sam Chulin also received awards from the Associated Press, United Press International, the Greater Los Angeles Press Club, and the Radio and Television News Association he will be greatly missed by all who knew him, survived by his wife and two sons. I had the opportunity uh, to see him at the parade, the Chinese parade that they held in downtown just recently. He was covering the, uh, the parade and uh, meeting with people, and he was a familiar face to Los Angeles. Uh, Sam Chulin, may he rest in peace. Ms. Perry? May I second that as well? I Absolutely. actually spoke with him a few times, and I was a journalism major, so we always had a chance to talk about that. And he was really just a really wonderful, nice, kind, open person. Thank you very much, Ms. Perry. Are there adjourning motions? Uh, one other announcement, colleagues, if you haven't seen it already, the City Council Gazette first uh, issue, which highlights work that each council member is doing in their district and um, also here legislatively, is now out. We will have copies shortly in the back of City Hall and something that can be sent um, to email and local papers as well for everybody's enjoyment, and that will be uh, a regular uh, publication. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. This meeting is adjourned. We will next meet tomorrow, Wednesday, um, March um, 8th, here at 10 a.m. Thank you. This meeting is adjourned.